moderator for this session, um, redefining your relationship with food. And I'm also a board member with the Wellness Council, so I'm really happy to see you all here and connect with you guys every year, and I'm happy to see so many new faces at the conference this year. So uh, again, as a board member, I'm always happy to hear how your experience is, reach out if you have any questions or concerns that I can pass on to the rest of the board and the planning committee. So thanks again for being here. Um, so this session is approved for CHED, so the, the sign-in sheet there is in the back. So make sure you utilize that if you need to before you leave. And uh, if you need anything else during the session, um, you can reach out and let me know. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce Laura here. And Laura works as a speaker, certified personal trainer, nutrition specialist, behavior change specialist, and certified stress and mindset coach. For the last decade, her mission has been to guide people health, stress, and life by reclaiming authority of their mind and learn how to face daily life challenges as who they want to be. Laura simplifies neuroplasticity to make it a, a usable tool for anyone who is ready to heal unhealthy relationships they have in their life, whether they be the stress, food, movement, communication, time, or themselves. Wherever Laura goes, her passion radiates whether that be with her personal clients or from on the stage. She empowers her people to open their minds to what's possible, expanding their worldview, and resetting their minds to align with their desired life experience. Creating an unstoppable belief, unstoppable belief within each and every person she gets to work with that no matter what life throws at them, they will thrive. Laura? How are we? That's pretty impressive for morning. Um, so I want to start with a story. When I was six years old, I broke my arm. I happened to be at my aunt's house for a holiday, and I was playing outside on the hammock with one of my cousins, and I noticed these bugs over my head, and they were bugging me. So like any bright six-year-old, I thought, I know, I'll stand up and I'll shoo them away. And that's precisely what I did. I'm happy to say I have not stood up on another hammock since. On this particular holiday, my mom was in Indianapolis for one of my cousin's graduation parties. So I was just with my dad. I was a scrappy kid, always finding myself with bumps and bruises, so this didn't seem too different. I remember him carrying me inside, wiping away my tears, putting an ice pack on. But then he offered me some of my aunt's world-famous brownies that I absolutely loved. But I said no. The next thing I remember is my dad calling my mom saying, she said no to the brownies. To which my mom said, take her to the hospital and I'll meet you there. If you read between the lines, you'll see the underlying message most of us were raised with. Food makes boo-boos feel better. This is just one of the messages that we get from our culture. And if we really want to redefine how we relate to food, we need to look at our food foundation meaning we need to understand how we relate to it, how we think of it, how we use it, how we connect with it. So I would love for you guys to get a pen and paper handy or keyboard or phone, you know, whatever you can write down, because I'm going to ask you to look at your food foundation for just a moment. We're just going to answer about three questions. First, how do you use food? What's food's current purpose in your life? And let me give you a couple examples. Maybe you use it to comfort your emotions, to stabilize your energy, to give you a boost when you're tired, to stimulate you when you're bored. Just think about it and remember, life is complex, so you might use it in more than one way. Second question, what are the life circumstances you experience that make you have an unhelpful or unhealthy relationship with food? Be that you're having a really long day and you opt for convenience instead of health, or you're really exhausted and you go to sugar for that quick bump. Again, just examples, but just think about it. And finally, how do you want to relate to food? 
as in how do you want to feel about food? How do you want food to make you feel? How do you want to be able to support your relationship with food when life gets hard and when life is easy? Thank you. So you can keep writing if you need to, but why does this matter? Like many of you, I grew up in a similar culture and I was exposed to the same messages. And we heard things like, if you just try this diet, you'll be healthy and lose weight. You need to take this supplement or this pill. If you exercise and eat well, then you'll lose the weight. If it were as simple as the messaging suggests, we wouldn't be dealing with the health crisis that we're currently facing. So I'm here to burst the bubble. It's not that easy. Growing up, my parents used to tell me that relationships take work. I know that they were talking about people, but why would that be any different when it comes to our relationship with food? I think a better question is, what does that work look like? I'm going to suggest it starts with questions like this, among some others, to really understand how you're relating to food, but then going deeper. You know, we tend to get fairly attached to our way of eating because it's comfortable. But if we want to redefine how we relate to food, we need to be open-minded. We need to be able to experiment to try different foods to see how all that makes us feel to begin with. Right? So in order to do that, we need to take a deeper look at how culture kind of influences us and manipulates us more for their bottom line rather than our waistline. So I'm going to dig a little deeper into the impact our relationship with food has on our life, how to nourish all of our mind and body hungers, and how to redefine your relationship to be empowering. But first, let's play a game. I'm going to say some common foodisms, and if you've heard of them, I need you to raise your hand. And this is what a raised hand looks like, not down here, OK? Ready? Comfort food. That, thank you. That is great. Thank you, guys. I was going to say, we've all heard of that one. Clean plate club. You can't leave the table till your plate is clean. Yeah. All right, one more. We'll see. You don't get dessert unless you finish your veggies, AKA dessert. Wow, okay, we've heard all three. So these are only a few of the hidden messages that influence our relationship with food. Where do they come from? Largely from society and our parents for everywhere we look, from TV, magazines, all over social media, commercials, our relationship is being influenced. There are hidden messages within the advertisement. I think we can all agree from the slides, what they're trying to say is women are supposed to be thin and real men eat meat. <laughs> but I'm going to suggest that our relationship with food goes even deeper than that. Consider these examples. When new parents bring home a baby, they want to do anything and everything to make sure that baby is OK. So when the baby starts to cry, they'll put it down for a nap, change a diaper, or give it food. Makes sense. But what if the baby's crying out for affection and we give it food? Or what if the baby's angry and we give it food? You see where the relationship begins. Or what if someone you know is injured or ill? We typically try to show our support by giving them a balloon or food, but not just any type of food. We're not looking for a veggie tray when we're injured. We want some of that comfort food, right? Or what about grief? When we've lost someone we love or when someone we know has, we want to show our support. And that support looks like flowers or food. But again, not that veggie tray. The message is clear. Food comforts negative emotions. The problem with this understanding is it creates a mindset that influences us to lean towards food when we feel angry, stressed, scared, anxious, or any of our other uncomfortable emotions. But those are the emotions of daily life. So a better question to ask is, are, is our relational challenge with food or with our emotions? The relationship between food and our emotions is so interwoven that the purpose of food has all but disappeared in our modern culture. It's become more about filling us up rather than fueling us. So I need those hands one more time. 
if you're confident like 10 out of 10 in your ability to recognize what your emotional needs are, notice when one is lacking, and know how to satisfy it up here. Look around. And on my hands demonstrating, I'm down here too. I'm with you guys. The reality is so much of our culture lives in a scarcity mindset. For those who don't know what a scarcity mindset is, ultimately, it speaks to us not believing that there's enough in this world. The thoughts look like, I don't have enough time, there's not enough money, I'm not successful enough, I'm not thin enough, fit enough, not good enough, you get the idea. At the heart of a scarcity mindset is lack. Now, as we just demonstrate, sadly, most of us don't know how to feel emotionally full. And what our uncomfortable emotions really symbolize is lack. When we're stressed, it's a lack of safety. Uncomfortable is a lack of experience. Bored, lack of simulation. Because we don't know how to fill our emotional needs, we go to food to fill us up. But that's not the purpose of food. First, food's purpose is to fuel us, not comfort us. It's when we lean into the comfort that we end up getting ourselves in trouble. So let me tell you a story to illustrate this a little bit better. Not too long ago, I moved across country. I was in my first and hopefully only global pandemic, started a business and bought my house. So as you can imagine, Stress and I were besties at the time. So I found myself doing what I do best, indulging in these delicious macadamia nut turtles from Costco. It wasn't but two weeks later that I looked in the mirror and I heard an old familiar voice. Ugh, you look so gross, you're so fat. Upon reflection, I had a revelation. New house, new business, new state, new pandemic. These were all unfamiliar stressors for me. But sadly, body shame was quite familiar. I was feeling a lack of emotional safety and I was using food to try and make me feel full. For at some point, my brain understood if I'm stressed out, food's there to put me into a different stressed out position one that I'm more equipped to manage. What this story illustrates is another element of our relationship with food. Our brain will subconsciously take self-sabotaging action if it provides some sense of perceived safety. Now for reference, I'm not talking about physical safety, but psychological safety. As in, your brain has taken that path so many times and neurons have fired and wired together that it knows you will survive this stress. So the pattern my brain has witnessed is me being exposed to excessive stress, going to food, and surviving it. So an element of my relationship with food is I always have to be mindful of when I'm feeling stressed because sometimes the first thing I notice that tells me I'm feeling stressed is a sugar craving. That's also what I notice when I'm feeling tired sometimes. So sometimes sugar cravings are about sugar for me. Sometimes they're not. We've all been exposed to different stressors in our life, and we've all had to adapt and learn different ways to protect ourselves. But some of those protective mechanisms aren't actually helpful as adults. They actually work against our, actual, our desired goals. For example, I have a client, I'm gonna call her Jane. And Jane wants a boyfriend, but she thinks because of her weight, that's why she can't get one. So I asked her, what she would blame if she had her ideal body. She said she didn't know, but thinking about it made her uncomfortable. So I asked her, how is keeping her current body helping keep her safe? She paused and thought about it, and then she broke into tears because she realized, if, if someone doesn't want to date me because my body, they're the jerk. But if someone doesn't want to date me for me, that's who I am. I don't know if I can survive that state of rejection. So she was subconsciously eating more to protect herself from having to feel that rejection. Like I said, it's when we lean into the comfort that we tend to get ourselves in trouble. We really need to reacquaint ourselves with food as fuel. So I ask again what the source of our relational challenge is. Is it with food or our emotions? For so long, we've been conditioned to think 
of food in a specific way. And if we aren't going to use food to help keep us safe, to help us cope, what are we supposed to do? We're taking away our main coping mechanism. Well, our body has all different types of needs. Another way of phrasing that is our body has all different types of hungers. A hunger for love, a hunger for connection, a hunger for rest, and more. But what we do psychologically is we create these giant categories in our brain, like food or hunger always being about food, when really it can be about our emotions as well. Or you go about your day and someone's like, hey, how are you doing? You're like, I'm good. Are you good? What does good mean? Do you even know what good means? I understand it as a social pleasantry, but when we use broad language like that, when we're talking about our relationship with food, we make things cloudy, and it makes it very easy for us to fall into destructive patterns. So as we're going about redefining our relationship with food, it begs the question, are we confusing ourselves because we're grouping things in these giant categories? What if some of these uncomfortable emotions we're pushing away are actually callings to teach us how to take care of our emotional well-being? To further that, I need to tell you about my client, Laura. She came to me wanting to lose weight and have a healthier, happier relationship with her health, meaning she didn't want to feel like a chore. Within the first six weeks, she was doing awesome. She was moving her body five times a week, she was ordering in less, and she was choosing foods that made her feel energized. But she had one problem that was eating at her, dessert. She loved dessert, and she was craving it every day. She was not eating it every day, but she was craving it every day. So I asked her how she feels on the days when she does eat dessert. And she said that she feels comforted, cozy, and satisfied. Well, temporarily, she added. When I asked her what it was replaced with, she said feelings of guilt and loneliness. Hmm, I thought, loneliness. From prior conversations, I know that Laura has a great relationship with her sister and often speaks with her in the evenings. So I inquired about her dessert patterns when she did speak with her sister. Turns out those were the nights she wasn't eating dessert. We talked a bit further and I asked her, is it possible that you're using food to numb your need for connection? When she reflected, she realized that's exactly what she was doing. Since then, she's created a regular pattern of connecting with people daily. And if she gets a dessert craving, she recognizes she needs connection, just as my stress signal was for sugar. For so long, we've been conditioned to think that all of our hunger pangs are about food, but they're not. The art of teaching lasting lifestyle health, lasting weight loss, has been one that's been gnawing at me my entire career. It's what inspired me to go from personal training to nutrition specialist to health and life coach, stress and mindset coach, and I'll let you know what comes next. But along that journey, I've learned five things that set all of us up to fail. I've literally never seen hundreds of clients ever succeed in the lasting element of health when they encounter these five things. And it all falls within one domain, our mindset. So let's touch on mindset real quick. To make sure we're all on the same page, I want to define it. And I prefer Dr. Aliyah Crum's definition, which is the core beliefs or assumption we have about a domain or category of things that orient us to a specific set of expectations, explanations, and goals. It's a mouthful, so I'm going to summarize it. Assumptions we make about a domain. So how does our mindset actually influence and impact our relationship with food? I need your eyes help again. Who here believes that exercise is good for you? Great. So when we experience the increased heart rate, shortness of breath, sweating, we categorize it as expected, accepted, and helpful. And what we get are positive body adaptations. Woo. Now, by a show of hands, who here believes that stress is bad for them? Okay. So when we experience the very same thing, shortness of breath, sweating, increased heart rate, we categorize it as not expected, not accepted, and unhelpful. 
And what we get are the negative body adaptations. But what's ironic is we're technically more physiologically stressed when we're exercising. So what accounts for the difference in how our body responds? Our mindset. What we're believing. When we believe something, the same exact signals are good for us, we dilate. When we believe it's bad for us, we constrict. Or let me give you another example. Not unlike many other young children, I did not like healthy food growing up. I was, I'll be honest, I was a brat. I'll, I'll take ownership for it. And uh, my parents used to say, you decide what you like before you put on your plate. Not to everyone, but just to me. Don't tell them they were right, but they were right. I would subconsciously make up my mind that I wasn't going to like something. I would take it like a pill with milk, you know? Again, bratty. But fortunately, along my journey, I was fortunate to have some friends who tricked me. They made a healthy meal and didn't tell me it was healthy until afterwards, and I liked it. And it made me curious. It made me willing to experiment with healthy food for myself. Was it that I didn't like healthy food? Or was it that my parents' cooking skills are just not you know, to this point where they know how to make healthy food taste good? Turns out the latter is true. And I've actually had so much fun in my adult career. Like it's like a game of how healthy and tasty can I make healthy food? So how does that actually affect my relationship with health? Well, before when I would go to restaurants, I wouldn't even look at salads or anything on the healthy side. I would go straight to pizzas, right? Now, I still enjoy pizzas, don't get me wrong, I'm human. But I actually like eating the healthier foods because I know it's taking care of myself and it feels good. So what I hope I'm illustrating is that our mindset predetermines how we're going to experience something. So when we're believing whatever we're believing about food, it's going to influence how we relate to it. So those five beliefs I told you about, do you want to know them? What? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Couldn't hear you. The first is willpower. We falsely believe we have to power our way through, use discipline, keep going. The problem with this is it works until it doesn't. And it makes, this is kind of random, but it makes me think of something that I read about David Blaine. And for those who don't know who he is, he's an extreme performance artist. He's known for things like being buried alive for seven days and submerging himself in an ice block for 72 hours. As extreme as that is, that wasn't what I found interesting. What I found interesting was his pre and post stunt prep. Before a stunt, he was insanely disciplined. He would match his breath rate with his walking pattern. He would be intentional about what hand he picked up food or drinks with. He was meticulous. But after, he couldn't get himself to do anything. He couldn't wake up when his alarm went off. He couldn't brush his teeth. He couldn't eat well. He couldn't do anything. He always gained weight. And there's a reason why his stunts were so far apart. So why? How can someone go from so meticulous to having no discipline and willpower whatsoever? Because he had exhausted his willpower muscle. And we do much of the same. I've worked with lots of brides, and we talk about habits. We, I think that they're going in habits. I'm not in their brain, so I can't really confirm that. But once they get to the actual wedding and after, all they get back is shame, judgment, and disappointment because they loved how they felt, so they wanted to continue it, but they didn't realize they were just willpowering their way through it, and that muscle has no, no juice left. Willpower is a Band-Aid. It's not a solution. Then there's a diet mindset. I'm gonna be honest, I don't like this one. This one bugs me. It doesn't make sense. If you do anything for a certain amount of time, you're gonna get a specific benefit. And when you stop doing it, the benefit goes away. Diet suggests an end date. So how do we expect ourselves to have sustaining weight loss if we're just dieting, dieting, next diet, that diet? You get the point. According to the Health Coach Institute, 98% of people gain the weight back after diet within six months. 98%. Diets, if anything, we can use them as guidance. This is a great way to build your plate. Here are some healthy moods, or moods, foods. And learn how to integrate that into our lifestyle routine to get those results as well. If anything, 
diet mindset is willpower with a different name, which takes me to the transactional mindset. This also works hand in hand with the first two. And we normally experience it as a lack of motivation or giving up on our journey. It sounds like if I do blank, then I'll get blank. If I exercise and eat well, then I'll look and feel the way I want to look and feel. No, it doesn't work like that. We've all, I mean, I'm not gonna say we all have, but I know I have done that. I have seen countless clients do that. We get this idea in our head of what the journey is gonna look like. We create expectations and we attach to them. And I've helped people lose weight from zero to 100 pounds. And I'll be completely honest, none of them had the journey or the visual appearance that they thought they'd end up having at the end. Transactional mindset, it's setting you up to fail because it's not an exchange like that when it comes to our health or our food. The lack of acceptance caught me off guard. I was very much a trainer of like, no pain, no gain. And then I went on this like weird spiritual holistic journey when I became a coach, it's been awesome. But I'm gonna quote Dr. Susan David to help people understand what acceptance is because her quote blew my mind. It's from her book, Emotional Agility. One of the great paradoxes of the human experience is we cannot change ourselves or our circumstances until we accept what exists right now. Acceptance is a prerequisite for change. We won't like what we don't like. We'll just cease to be at war with it. And once the war is over, change can begin. I feel like we misunderstand acceptance. We think of it as approval or giving up or quitting, but really it's just not being in denial. I can't tell you the number of clients who said, I can't accept my body, then I can't lose weight. Well, this is your body, whether you accept it or not. If anything, your resistance just is making it harder and creating more suffering. Which reminds me of another quote. What we resist persists, what we tolerate takes over, and what we challenge will change. When we're busy resisting ourselves, which is what we're doing when we're not accepting ourselves, we're just adding more stress to our system, which makes it harder for us to actually get the desired result. And the last of the big five is fear of our emotions. Our emotions are intertwined in everything we do. We are emotionally tied to our cars, our clothes, food, you name it. But how we relate to it is actually shocking. I went to a conference last November. There was probably 1,500 people in the room. And the host asked people to raise their hands if they were afraid of feeling their feelings. And I was shocked by the number of hands that went up. If you don't like feeling them, I get that. But afraid of it? I'd estimate somewhere around 80% of the hands went up. But the problem with this is we're talking about change. We're talking about getting healthier, redefining your relationship with food. How our brain works is when we've walked a path over and over and over again, that's how we get comfortable. When we're talking about change, your brain doesn't have that path. It doesn't know that, so it will be uncomfortable. If we're afraid of feeling uncomfortable, how are we supposed to change? Do you see the problem? These five don't work. If this is what we're using, if this is our motivation, we're just putting a Band-Aid. We're not actually giving a solution. Speaking of solutions, let's talk about them. Sorry, long time to talk without water. It's a three-step solution. First, we need to break our emotional conditioning. Then we need to understand our physical hunger and fullness signals. And finally, we needed to change our thinking pattern. I feel like at this point, it's clear that our emotions and food go hand in hand. So if we're gonna break our emotional conditioning, we need to look at our emotional experience. For so long, we've been taught that emotions are bad, when really they're neither good nor bad. It's how we think about them that gives them their power. Consider this example. When you're feeling angry or sad, it's like you can't escape that emotion. But when you're feeling joy, it's like you can't hold on to it. So why the difference? Well, how often do you try to avoid feeling joy? Most people say never. Emotions are the language of the body. They communicate what we need and act as an internal GPS. If we're feeling lonely, we need connection. If we need a break, we might feel overwhelmed. We've been so conditioned to numb these daily negative emotions, but what we need to do is learn to hold space to understand the deeper body need within that's calling out. 
I get it. I don't like feeling uncomfortable either. And it's that relationship, our resistance to feeling uncomfortable with our emotions that creates a dysfunction in our relationship with food. In a way, we're all addicts. When our external reality exceeds our internal comfort and we go to food to change our internal experience so we're more comfortable, the same way that anyone who struggles with substance abuse does, they use their drugs or alcohol to change their internal experience. I'm not good with this stuff, so I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Click. All right. Well, okay, sure. Let's just, we're just going to keep rolling. Um, what we need to do instead is look at our emotions in a different way. And if anything, this is an example of the first step of breaking your emotional conditioning, which is not running from the discomfort. We need to build our resilience to these uncomfortable emotions and understand that within them, they hold valuable data. You don't have to enjoy them or like them, but your joy or pleasure actually isn't gonna change whether you experience it. We're going around resisting an inevitable part of life only to create more suffering, and oh, we're back, only to create more suffering within ourselves. We have power there. We don't like to suffer. We don't need to suffer. If you ask me, it comes down to choice. We can choose to be brave enough to face the uncomfortable emotions that we're experiencing, which will build our resilience, our capacity, our skills, and I don't know if this one matters as much, but boost our joy in life as well. Or we can continue to hide from these uncomfortable emotions and remain victim to them. But keep in mind, not choosing is also choosing. So what that means is we need to learn to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. The good news is we misunderstand our comfort zone. We typically think of it as a concrete box, but really it's quite fluid. Think about when you start a new job. You wanna do anything and everything to you know, excel, show you're valuable, but it's uncomfortable. Even if you have previous experience, it's a new spot, you don't know what your daily things are, but after a couple months, you start to get the hang of it. And after a few years, you could pretty much do it in your sleep. But wasn't this uncomfortable? So what changed? Experience. The only difference between what we find comfortable and what we find uncomfortable is the amount of experience that we've had. To that point, I could similarly call our comfort zone our experience zone and our discomfort zone our inexperience zone. You remember what I said earlier, we give our emotions power based on how we think about them. And when we're avoiding them because they're uncomfortable, all that really means is we need to have a little experience so that they're not as uncomfortable. What I find the most ironic about all this is our emotions are in the part of our brain called the amygdala, which is located in our limbic brain. And our limbic brain is nicknamed the motivational triad meaning the purpose of our emotions is actually to motivate us. We're just so bogged down with the discomfort that we're missing the motivational message within and we're just leaning on self-sabotage. But we, if we can practice sitting with these uncomfortable emotions and stop rushing to our results, we can actually set ourselves free. So as you go about redefining your relationship with food, understand that sometimes it's gonna be messy but you have to allow yourself to sit in the discomfort to expand your current state and heal. Quick survey. Who here prefers sunny days to rainy days? Sunny day people? All right, where are my rainy day people? I know they exist, thank you guys. Let me ask my sunny day people a question. Do you think you'd be able to appreciate the beauty and warmth of the sun had you never experienced the rain? I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of these, so no. The same is true with our emotions. What we don't realize is when we try to numb or avoid our uncomfortable emotions, we also limit our experience of joy, happiness, and peace, to name a few. So as you go about expanding yourself, your resilience, your relationship with food, understand you're doing so, and you're gonna get a better experience of your positive emotions. 
So what does breaking your emotional conditioning look like in real life? Let me tell you. I'm a daddy's girl through and through. And if you could not tell, that is my father. And if you ever met him, you would understand. He is the greatest. <laughs> but unfortunately, my dad does not have the best health. The first time that he was in the hospital in my adult life, I stopped by the grocery and grabbed a thing of edible cookie dough to bring with me to the hospital and eat by his hospital bed. Sadly, not too long ago, he was back in the hospital. And I thought I was going to lose him. Sadness and fear consumed me. So I leaned on my coping menu. I walked in a lot of beautiful parks. I journaled until my hand hurt. And I meditated as much as I could. It was three days later that I found myself in front of a cold stone. I came home with my pint of ice cream, ready to emotionally numb out. I had about four bites, and then I threw it out. And when I got to the couch, my husband's like, why did you just throw out ice cream? That's silly. And I told him it wasn't working. Naturally, he's confused, because how does ice cream not work? And I had to explain that I wasn't actually wanting the ice cream. I was just looking for a break from the sadness that had been consuming me. So I share this story to illustrate, one, it's not a perfect practice. And two, it's about slowly stretching yourself until the food really does lose its appeal. And if you pay attention to my story, I lasted three days longer than I had previously. I tried three new things for my coping menu and ultimately I threw it out. That's progress and I'm damn proud. <laughs> when we're talking about redefining our relationship with food, when food has been our coping tool, we need to be able to create new coping tools. We need to be able to not just abandon ourselves, but support ourselves. So if you look back to how you use food from that food foundation question right at the beginning, when you're thinking of your coping menu, you want to think of ways that you can support those needs, how you're using it. For example, when I'm angry, I like cold exposure. Do I like cold? No. I moved from Chicago to Florida to get away from it. I don't like it. But when I'm angry, it consumes me and helps me cool down. If I'm annoyed, frustrated, something like that, puppy cuddles always works. Laughter, reading, very effective. So when you're building a coping menu, understand these things, they change my internal environment just as food does because I can connect with the feelings that I'm doing. We don't have to lean on food, but we do need to support our needs with that. Which takes me to the second pillar. We need to understand our physical hunger and fullness signals much better. Our body likes to automate everything. And when we've been eating in similar patterns for years and years, our hormones sink and release, telling us that we're hungry, making us think we're hungry when really we're not. There's a difference between mental and physical hunger. And I'm gonna need your guys' participation one more time. I don't need you to actually answer this question because it's weird, but we all do it. How do you know when you need a poop? <laughs> think about it, just think about it. Maybe feel some pressure in your gut. Maybe it feels a little uncomfortable. But when you know you gotta go, you know, right? I'm guessing you don't add your food, plus your water, divided by your sleep and stress and tell your boss you need a 15 minute break at 3.30? <laughs> right. But that is what we do with food. We trust our body to tell us when we need to eliminate ourselves, but we don't trust it to tell us when we need to fuel ourselves. By a show of hands, who here has ever experienced a belly growl? See, your body is talking to you. That is a true hunger signal, not pregnancy, but hunger signals. <laughs> it's similar with fullness. We all know what it feels like when we've eaten too much and we're bloated and we need to unbutton our pants. Does anyone like that feeling? Yeah, me either. We need to expand our awareness of what it feels like to be satisfied. Where we've eaten some food, we feel good, but there's space in our gut. We could go for a walk if we wanted to. And one thing to note when it comes to fullness is how you build your plate matters when you're trying to understand what satisfaction physically feels like. And you're gonna get it wrong and right to kind of learn that journey. But when you build a plate that's balanced with nutrient dense foods, you actually find a sensation of satisfaction that's so desirable, it's worth energy and inconvenience. So what I have my clients do 
is start by writing down, that part's important, writing down the physical signals for light hunger, hunger, hanger, satisfied, full, and stuffed. And then learn to eat at true hunger and stop at satisfied. How is that going to help redefining your relationship with food? I'm going to need another story. As I mentioned, I have my own business called Change by Challenge. And I don't know if you guys know this, but when you start a business, you work a lot. And there was one night a few years ago, I was working about 16 hours and I had about 30 minutes left. But all I could do was think about sugar. Now I know myself well enough that I don't really keep it in the house. But my husband, he <laughs> likes himself some sugar. So I was thinking about what he might have that I would enjoy. And fortunately, in my thought process, I was able to pause and check in with my belly. And what I realized is I was actually experiencing my fullness signals. So I closed my eyes, I took a deep breath, and I asked myself, what am I actually feeling? The answer was exhausted. So I went to my coping menu, which brought me to laughter. I went to YouTube, put on bloopers of Park and Rec. If you have not watched the show, it's worth a watch. Laughed my butt off for about 15 minutes and I was energized for another 90 minutes. What this story illustrates is another component of our relationship with food. A message we get from culture is go, get things done, be efficient. Urgency is a theme. We're all participating subconsciously or consciously in this fictitious race, but it's really hard to take care of ourselves and meet our needs when we're in that race. But maybe that's the point. Maybe it's easier for some people in our world for us to be less aware and thus more controllable. For awareness is how we create change. So it really boils down to understanding that productivity isn't the goal. Running around like a chicken with your head cut off just because you're afraid you're not doing enough, scarcity mindset. We need to recognize that it's not necessarily about how much we do, but how we're being as we're doing. If you're running around task to task to task to task and you're just depleted, burnt out, exhausted at the end of the day, you're going to miss it. The subtle signals that our body sends us to help us better take care of ourselves. But there's another way that you can do it. You can believe in yourself. You can trust your intuition and your instincts. You can remember all the things that you've gotten done and all the deadlines you've been able to meet in your life and realize you don't have to race a clock to get as much done. And what you'll be able to get is stabilized energy, uh, optimal output, access to your greatest intelligence, and again, joy, more enjoyment in life, which I feel like we don't value enough. But that's a different conversation. With that being said, it takes us to the final pillar of the equation, how we think. I said I wanted to help you redefine your relationship and for it to be empowering. And if you look at the first two pillars, by breaking your emotional conditioning, you're going to unhook from how we use food to cope. If you recognize your physical hunger and fullness, you're going to relearn how to fuel yourself. But the lifestyle, all that starts in the mind. So how we think is the hardest, but probably also the most important. We're run by our hormones. When we're more stressed, more cortisol is released. When we're more tired, more melatonin is released. But all that starts with a thought. Now, most of us have tried some diet in our life, so most of us have a bad taste in our mouth at the idea of a diet, myself included. So if we want to understand how we've been thinking about diets, we need to explore our experience so we know what not to do moving forward. When we have thoughts like, I can't eat this, I shouldn't have that, I have to have the salad, ugh, just icky. It makes it feel like a chore. And I haven't liked doing chores since I was a... I've never liked doing chores. Actually, I still don't like doing chores. Not only is the thinking unpleasant, but it leads to the inevitable binge. It creates the rebellion in us. So let me be clear. I'm not talking about another diet. I'm talking about a completely different way of relating and thinking about food. That means sometimes you indulge and sometimes you don't. There's nobody telling you what you should or shouldn't have, what you have to eat, or what you can or can't do. Instead, I encourage my clients to befriend foods that are friendly to them. Let's say you like cheese. But cheese might not always be super friendly to you. 
Maybe you and cheese don't hang out every day. Maybe you guys are more of weekend pals. It's not that you can never have it. It's about understanding how it makes you feel and choosing when you're okay to feel that way. To me, I think of it similar to alcohol. If you had a big presentation tomorrow, you likely wouldn't go out boozing tonight and risk the hangover, right? Well, if you know that dairy doesn't settle well down there, you probably don't want to have nachos before the very same presentation. It's not that you can't have these things, but it's a call to reconnect with how food actually makes you feel. We like to feel good. Is there anyone in here who likes feeling bad? Yeah. Our brain likes it too. And whether we recognize it or not, when we eat healthier, we feel better. We feel good. And when we eat unhealthier, it's not a call to judge or shame ourselves. If anything, it's a motivational reminder for why we want to eat healthy. Right. This doesn't feel good. That's why I eat this way all the time. We need that reminder every now and then. It keeps us on the horse. When we change our thinking out of restriction and into friends we want to hang out with based on how we want to feel, it becomes a choice, not a chore. Now, before I kind of wrap things up and give you guys space for questions, there's one more really important thing I need you to understand. But hold on. I need to explain the foundation of our psychology because we're talking about change. And if you don't know what to expect to experience, it's very easy to fall back into the same old patterns. So we are run on a homeostasis loop. What that means is our brain has taken a specific path so many times that it is now automated, anticipated, and key to regulating our body. And once we've taken it enough, our brain conditions our body hormonally, and then our body keeps our brain hooked on the same pattern of being. This starts at a very young age. The foundation of what we believe to be true about ourselves, others, and the world is established primarily around the age of seven and eight. Then our mental filter wakes up. The mental filter's main purpose is to weed through all the information we gather and select specific information. But how does it choose what it absorbs it's based on what we believe meaning we live in a reality where our beliefs create our experience and our experience filtered through our mental filter confirms our beliefs and that provides the brain with a feeling of safety so if you're trying to stop emotional eating at the end of the day but you also have a belief that you're not good enough you will subconsciously crave food every single night continue the late night eating to provide evidence to your brain that you're not good enough. It's twisted, I know, but our brain cares about survival, not pleasure. And that's just the first loop. The second loop brings us into our thoughts, feelings, and hormones. So after our belief and mental filter loop is created, then it will start to promote thoughts. And every time we have a thought, we get a feeling. And every time we have a feeling, it releases an energy that causes a hormone to secrete. As we practice being that person over and over and over again, that's when our body then gets addicted to that state of being and then gets our brain hooked on the same thing. Now that's a lot of science. I'm sorry for boring you, but here comes the important part, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about the change loop because this is what you need to understand, what to expect to experience. Because our body is so automated and so conditioned and hooked on its normal patterns, when you are choosing to behave differently, you're going to be taking away something that our body's used to having, a specific hormone. So an alternative hormone is going to release, and that's going to make you feel uncomfortable. And then you're going to have some uncomfortable thoughts. And the whole purpose of that is to try and promote you, provoke you to get back on the homeostasis loop. So let me give you an example. When I was trying to break my stress addiction, I was working like 5 a.m. to 8 or 9-ish. I was trying to take a break in the middle of the day. What I felt, I would sit on the couch, try and read or watch one episode of you name it. I felt gravity. Like I truly felt like there was something pulling me back into my office. I would feel like there were spiders crawling out of my skin and I would randomly break into a sweat. It was very, very strange. I'd hear thoughts like you're not doing enough. You're going to fail. Entrepreneurs have to work tirelessly. What makes you think that you can do this? 
if I wouldn't have known what I was experiencing was the change loop, I would have gone back to my office and kept working. And I did for the first two months that I tried to take a break. It took me two months to realize like, hold up, this is what it is. It's just keep trying to provoke. I don't have to believe those thoughts. I don't have to believe those feelings. So if you're gonna redefine your relationship with food, if you're gonna bring this information back to your employers or whoever it might be, understand you're going to feel uncomfortable. But that doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. If anything, it means you're probably doing something right. You have to be in your brain, being the authority of your mind, knowing who's talking. Is this the homeostasis loop? Or is this me truly trying to change? Make sense? So with that, let me summarize. There are hidden messages around food that have been following us around, influencing the relationship we've had with food our entire life. We were never taught how to translate the brain-body communication pathway. If anything, we were taught to use food to cope with uncomfortable emotions. To change that, we need to expand ourselves to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. That means allowing ourselves to experience our uncomfortable emotions and to be curious enough to find the hidden message within so that we can understand how to best take care of our true need rather than just numbing ourselves out. Don't leave yourself high and dry on this journey. You need to create a coping menu and if we look at your food foundation and how you use food, it's literally a direct path to what do I need in that moment. If you can learn to satisfy what you need and expand your coping menu, you won't need food. Learn to tune in to what your true hunger and fullness signals are so that you can trust your hunger signals rather than wondering if your brain's just manipulating you into coping. And finally, boo chores. Think about food differently. Befriend foods that are friendly to you. Choose what foods you want to eat based on how you want to feel. With that being said, I know that you guys could have chosen anywhere to go and listen to someone and you guys came and listened to me and I want you to know I really do appreciate your presence and I appreciate how involved in all the arm raises that we got in there. So thank you for listening. Um, does anyone have any questions? Well, if you do, there is a card for most of you. If the people in the back don't have them, there's some extra ones up front or there's these places that you can find me and contact me. Um, but I love helping people. So if you have questions or if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. But thank you guys. All right. Um, thank you, Laura. So don't forget to check signing to the back if you need that.